Welcome to the dialogue. I am Dr. Ham Shivani, President of California State University Stanislaus, and I'm the host for this program. Dialogue features interviews with community leaders, elected officials, faculty, students, and other friends of the university. At California State University Stanislaus, we are proud of the strong partnership we have throughout the community, and we are equally proud of the initiatives we have accomplished to build a nationally recognized top quality institution of higher education. Our guest for today's program is Fresno businessman T.J. Cox, who is also running for the Congress against United States Congressman George Radanovich. Mr. Cox has spent a career in engineering and construction as a builder of commercial and residential projects. He has also used the expertise to work with Habitat for Humanity in building homes for the less fortunate in Central California and Armenia. T.J. Cox is a conservationist and outdoors man who is a strong advocate for smart growth and comprehensive regional planning. Mr. Cox, welcome to the program. Thanks. It's wonderful to be here today. As a, a newcomer, I suppose, to the politics, um, maybe you want to start with telling us a little bit about your background and uh, um, <coughs> what uh, led you uh, to this plateau that you want to run for the Congress. Please. Uh, I'm an engineer, a businessman, a husband, a father to four children, and I worry that our generation will be the first generation to leave their kids with a society, a country, with less opportunity, less freedom. That's maybe not as healthy as the uh, society that was afforded to us. That's on a large picture. Um, here locally, uh, it is clear the people of the 19th Congressional District deserve representation in Washington. We're not getting it now. That's uh, very short and sweet, and Chris. <laughs> let us let us start with some questions. I start with um, perhaps uh, um, not selfishly, but um, uh, you know, since we're sure. uh, we are in education <laughs> business yeah. and we love all of our elected officials and we yes. bring them in. The first question is that um, is of course the whole concept of higher education mm -hmm. and. Um, um, as a, a, a congressman, we're certainly um, uh, representing uh, our district. We would love uh, someone that can help higher education. Um, in the past two years, let me um, focus my question. In the past two years, Pell Grants uh, has been lowered, I mean, every year. Pell Grant um, was uh, down 13.6 uh, um, uh, from 13.6 billion in 2004 to 2005 to 12.7 billion, so that's a substantial drop. Now the average Pell Grant uh, recipient uh, funding declined by 120 dollars. Mm -hmm. Uh, from two thousand four hundred seventy-four dollars to two thousand three hundred fifty-four, and you know, as a uh, president of a university that uh, has a students uh, student body with forty-five percent, who forty-five percent are recipient of Pell Grant, um, and I'm sure there are many other Cal states and UCs of similar um, composition. What uh, are you going to do about it? Well, President, uh, the most recent cuts to Pell Grant funding were passed just in the fall under the Deficit Reduction Act, which my opponent voted for. He voted to cut Pell Grant funding for the students in our district. Now, that's to me, that's a vote I would not make. I'd be voting to increase Pell Grant funding. I've always thought, uh, in my let me say, my parents were in education. My father was a university professor. Uh, so I, I, I completely realize the value. And, and I think the true value, what everyone has to realize is that the true value of America is really in its educational system. You know, it's through education. Absolutely. It's through education that the circumstances of your birth don't dictate the boundaries of your opportunity. And that's a great gift that America gives to all of its citizens. Uh, and so I think we need to 
fund more education, particularly higher education. And uh, this administration, this Congress, has been uh, intent on cutting that. They like to push it off to the private sector. I think uh, investing in education is the most worthwhile thing we can invest in. Appreciate it. Particularly, I, I uh, would be remiss to say that uh, the cost of tuition and fees have gone up 35 uh, percent um, just um, uh, in the past uh, few years. Sure. And this is, and in California, certainly, and Pell Grant, if tuition and fee goes up and Pell Grant goes down, it's, uh, it, it's a devastating effect. Absolutely. We need to put more people in the college, not fewer. I appreciate that. Uh, what do you, um, I know one of the uh, hottest topics you're going to be dealing with, uh, if elected, and I'm sure you're already facing in the community, particularly as a contractor, as an engineer, as, as a builder, this whole notion of uh, illegal immigrants. Um, what do you think is going to, what is your position on it? And what do you, what is the direction you want to go? Because, you know, there are Im illegal immigrants that are in this country. Mm -hmm. The question is whether we decide to uh, help them, to facilitate them to go to education or not, or keep them out. I mean, this is apparently the debate. And um, what is your solution for that? I mean, we certainly are, I know that we are, we are dependent on many immigrants, of course, while yes. sitting down here. I'm, I am honored to be here. but. But there are, um, there are also, uh, I mean, this country is built on immigration. Uh, but um, this question of illegal immigrant is. Yeah, I, I think you're probably just like my parents. My parents came here in the 50s. Uh, I'm a child of immigrant parents who came to the United States and they asked for an opportunity. They pursued higher education. And although they're from other companies, they first and foremost consider themselves Americans. That's right. Uh, the country's been built by immigrants. They contribute to our economy, our society today. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, though, the current immigration policy is really no policy. It's, uh, there's no policy at all to, to, uh, to deal or work with the people that are here. We certainly need a policy that ensures everyone in our country, all the visitors to our country, are here legally. And when they're here, they don't tax our social services, our health services, our law enforcement agencies. Uh, but we can have that policy if we have people that are willing to work across party lines to reach a common sense solution. And that's what we don't have. We don't have common sense back in Washington anymore. We have two political parties that want to fight uh, and drive wedge issues amongst us. Everyone knows we need a common sense uh, immigration policy. Uh, look at uh, Bill Gates the other day, or a couple months ago, he was saying that the reason why he has to go offshore to get engineers is because of the number of H1, uh, H1, visas. H1 visas that have been cut by 67%. Uh, right now we only let 65,000 H1 visas in the country, whereas you know, five years ago it was 200,000. And so he's looking overseas for work when those jobs could be here in the States. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Um, you know, probably one of the hottest uh, topic uh, today in this country is, of course, beside the election, is Iraq. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure you knew that I'm <laughs> going yeah. to be asking you this question. Uh, kind of li uh, putting aside the rhetoric. Sure. Uh, there is, uh, it seems to me there, there, there are a couple of fundamental questions. Uh, the question is whether the United States um, to begin with, should have gone to Iraq or not? I mean, that's almost a passe question. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can debate on it. We understand. But, but if the decision was to go in, was uh, the intention the liberation of Iraq which, or the occupation of Iraq? It seems to me that that's the, the topic that no, <coughs> very few people talk about it, but that, that is the whole uh, kind of essence of the the issue. Yes, Saddam was removed. Now, how long? Mm -hmm. Iraq was liberated. Well, it's going to take many years to build a real democracy. Certainly, in this country, it was quite 200 years until that democracy was built. But uh, we are in a different time, of course. But well, what is your? What do you? What do you? What would you? 
Uh, uh, the, the first thing I want to say is I was in Modesto last Thursday right. when it was announced that another soldier from Modesto had been killed in Iraq, uh, Staff Sergeant Gage. Right. And I want to say that our thoughts and our prayers go out to his family. Absolutely. He has sacrificed his life for our country. Uh, and we're all in deep gratitude towards him and his family. Uh, the current situation in Iraq is unacceptable. There is no plan, no plan for doing anything other than spending more money and losing more lives. The situation in Iraq is a problem for not just the U.S., but for the entire world, the entire world. And uh, we need to get together with all of the stakeholders in that region to develop a plan uh, to ensure the uh, safety uh, and democracy of that country as that country moves forward. As you said, the geopolitical uh, politics of that country have been totally turned upside down. It used to be, uh, it was right now, Iraq is the first and only Shia-led uh, Arab country. And uh, with them being such close alignment with Iraq, that causes uh, all kinds of, uh, it's, a, it's a whole new, as I said, geopolitical dynamic in that region. And so uh, you see the emergence of uh, Iranian hegemony, really. Uh, and so that's, uh, for, the, uh, for the Sunni Arab countries in that nation, they're rightfully worried about that. Uh, and how we go about solving the problem going forward, it's, uh, it's going to take a lot more than me sitting here in, in uh, Turlock, but we need a new plan. We have to start at least discussing different strategies for the Middle East. Uh, I don't agree with my opponent who said, he expects us, the United States, to be in the country, to be occupying the country for the next 30 to 50 years. Are we going to have our children and our children's children, kids who have yet to be born, dying in Iraq and spending, uh, uh, spending trillions and trillions of dollars over there? We talked earlier about the cuts in Pell Grant funding. Well, that's a choice we're making. We can fund education here in America where mm -hmm. we can spend $2 billion a week mm -hmm. in Iraq. That is um, a very interesting scenario, certainly. Um, but coming uh, more back home to <coughs> subjects which are near and dear to many of our uh, audience um, and many residents of the region, is uh, there are two questions. Uh, resources, these beautiful natural resources, the agricultural land um, being converted to yeah. Houses, commercial, industrial, whatsoever, um, without much of comprehensive regional planning. Of course, there are cert several cities, like City of Turlock, that have uh, embarked on a very solid planning program. But there are not all the cities have the plans, and city planning stops by the boundary. Mm -hmm. As you know, that uh, in order to for planning to be more efficient has to be more regional. That's one issue. The other one is the transportation simultaneously. I mean, our roads here in California are not necessarily mm -hmm. um, even up to standard. Yes, I was going to yes, say yes. not very good, but <laughs> I thought that's a very underestimation. Right. Yes. Um, what's your view on it, I mean, in terms of? Uh, regional planning, it, it's one of the key issues that I want to be concerned about on the federal level. And although that you say, it is a, it's a local, it's a regional planning issue. There ought to be a federal element involved in that because on the federal side, you take care of most of the transportation needs. You certainly provide most of the transportation funding. And so you, all you have to do is go back to Los Angeles County, Orange County, which 40 years ago, 50 years ago, was the number one agricultural counties in America. And then 20 years later, they were paved over. And you can see that happening here today when we see orchards and fields, you know, one, uh, you know, in the blink of an eye, there are new subdivisions and, you know, strip malls and shopping centers. Uh, the federal government needs to be involved in that regional planning process, as I said, because they dictate uh, the transportation needs. And so are we going to have uh, suburbs that are served by freeways or are we going to have, you know, smaller, denser communities that are served by light rail? And when we talk about infrastructure, uh, in the last transportation bill, in the last transportation bill, it was a $286 billion uh, funding. And if you divide that by 435 congressional districts, the average funding per congressional district was $650 million. The average is $650 million. 
the 19th Congressional got 13 million. We got the lowest amount out of any of California's congressional districts with a congressman that's been in office for 12 years. Uh, just imagine what we could do if we got our fair share of highway funding. Now, I debated that point the other day with my opponent on radio, and he said the 19th Congressional gets what it deserves, not a penny more. What the 19th Congressional deserves is a new congressman. So, um, may I, um, can I ask a sub-question about sure. 99, because we're talking about transportation, but one thing which is, I think, near and dear to all of us, including myself, is this uh, route, uh, Highway 99. Sure. Which, um, it's really that extremely substandard. I mean, some developing countries that's, have. That's, uh, that's funny that you said that. <laughs> know that. Uh, 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 and it, 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 the businesses are suffering. P residents are suffering about that road. That was the specific point we were discussing, and that mm -hmm. in the last transportation bill, for funding 499 and the like, we got the lowest amount out of any of California's congressional districts. Uh, Bill Thomas in the uh, 18th, uh, Bakersfield, they got 700 million for their freeways. We got 13 million over five years. If we just got our fair share. We could have a decent freeway. We could have an interstate going up there. Uh, it's uh, we've just been uh, disregarded in that in that aspect. Sure. Let me um, go back to education. I'm sure uh, uh, you know that uh, you're well aware of this uh, commission on the future of higher education, which was headed by uh, Secretary Spelling, Margaret mm -hmm. Spelling. The report is out and calls for much greater deal of accountability and performances of K-12, higher education, um, assessment. Uh, what's, what's your take on it? Uh, my take on it is when I talk to uh, parents, when I talk to educators, uh, teachers particularly, they say that uh, the No Child Left Behind Act uh, and some of these uh, kind of metric metrics that are used to gauge performance isn't working. Uh, it's an unrealistic education policy. Uh, there's a predominance of testing, not teaching. There's not enough flexibility, and it's so punitive in that if somebody doesn't make a test score, you know, the, the schools get uh, hard, they get funding taken away. Uh, I think we need a real education policy moving forward. The No Child Left Behind Act is up for reauthorization in 2007. We need the educators, the teachers, administrators, all of the stakeholders to come together and develop a real education policy, and one that's uh, completely funded. No Child Left Behind Act, we all know, uh, uh, instilled a number of mandates on teaching facilities, uh, schools, mm -hmm. but uh, there was a certain short shortfall in funding. Uh, I think we need more flexibility. You know, when I talk to teachers, they tell me, uh, you know, it's taking the fun out of teaching. I've met so many teachers who have gotten out of teaching a profession they love because of No Child Left Behind. I'm sure that you know that uh, the number one thing that you should be doing with your career is at least is having fun. You should enjoy every day what you're doing. Certainly. Um, but would you, uh, would you acknowledge that there are serious problems with the K-12 education? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly. I mean, certainly. Uh, 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 here the, in the, the things is the things is broken. Is not. It is. And when we talk about K-12 through education right. uh, here in the Valley, well, we have 30 or 40 percent of the kids who don't graduate from high school. And we also have uh, almost from uh, every hundred that graduate from high school, only about 24, 25 percent of them are are them are qualified to go to university, right? And out of that twenty-five percent, a large portion of them require remediation. Absolutely, absolutely. So that that doesn't speak very well for our K twelve education system in no. California. So no, and and to a certain extent, there's a huge demographic element that uh, uh, because of that, that they don't have the parental support at home to be able to help them in teaching, and so. Uh, you know, the thing I found is so valuable and is such a good investment is more uh, investment in vocational and technical training. Because uh, really, from coming from a, you know, from a, a very economically depressed family to immediately go to college, a lot of times there's a step in between. Let's get into the uh, middle class in the vocations and technical. Uh, certainly part of my, my platform is an increased emphasis on that vocational and technical 
uh, training because for the kids who aren't going to college, they still deserve an opportunity to learn a trade where they can be a contributing member to society. So, so you are supportive of um, the traditional vocational high oh, school Yeah, yeah more supportive. I think we ought to have a, a renewed emphasis on Having that. Having tracks for... I tell you, the other day, uh, I was talking to a principal of a vocational school who told me of a student who was a, a junior in high school. Through that first year, through that junior year in high school, he picked up enough construction skills during the summer, he got a job paying $21 an hour. And then his father didn't want him to continue on to a senior year in school because he was contributing so much to the family. Uh, the principal, the employer, the teachers got together. They saw, went and saw the parent, convinced the parent to uh, let the student finish high school. The uh, student finishes up his last year of high school. The employer re-employs him. And the kid's now making $50 an hour, over $50 an hour, in a construction-related field. That's where his talents lay. He was never going to college. Uh, and so that's, but he, he's got an education, an education, you know, uh, working sure. with his hands. Absolutely. And now, he, now he's uh, just doing great. Uh, but, you know, this is a very, very important topic, as, as you said it, articulated earlier on, is the foundation of democracy and foundation of the economic prosperity, education, what I mean, is that, well, in higher education, if we don't have enough high school graduating who are qualified, we're in trouble because we don't have the, yeah. the input. Uh, I mean, we don't have the intakes. Now, um, but given the demo uh, demographic um, uh, you know, factor of our population, but the same um, compositions now exist in many parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. And if you look at uh, France, England, um, uh, Spain, and Germany, and others, they have very, very diverse communities now and kind of um, really uh, accommodating the high schools and so forth. Okay, they have these very stringent final exams, which are uniform and people have to pass. And it has worked in Europe, I mean, that, and the workforce is very well. And granted, there are two tracks. You can go to technical or you can go to the university line. Academy or technical, vocational. And uh, many people do go to vocational, and it, that, that doesn't mean they're second class citizens at all. In fact, uh, wages and prosperity sometimes is even higher. But it's the choice. Uh, so, what I'm trying to, um, to get at is that do you agree with these um, types of um, you know, real uh, final assessments? Oh, a yeah. absolutely. We should definitely have accountability. But as you pointed out, they they have two separate tracks, both equal. Okay. Well, look at our current government, our governor here in California. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger didn't take the university track. He took the technical uh, vocational track into sales. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, it's where your talents lie. It's uh, Frankly, it's a mistake to assume that all of the kids ought to be going to college. Uh, but the kids that are should be prepared to start college with all the tools uh, that they need uh, before they enter. So you're supportive of you know stringent uh, exams uh, and I'm high I'm supportive of, of exams, but what I'm more supportive of is coming in talking to people like yourself, right. talking to educators, and letting the educators form the education policy rather than the politicians. My background's in engineering, all right? You wanna talk to me about engineering, I can talk all day about teaching children, I'm not, a, I'm not a classroom teacher, so I don't have that experience, and I don't gotcha. have that background to be able to say this is what we ought to be doing. I'm going to rely on the people that are out there to appreciate build that. Uh, I, the final question, since we're running out of time, is, uh, you know, average citizen that is uh, uh, sitting out there and, and listening to us and watching us, uh, as if I was, I would say, what's in it for me? You know, you know, this is the, and, and to kind of paraphrase that question is that there is a fundamental uh, problem facing America, American middle class today. The mid-America is somehow forgotten. Look, the rich is getting richer, and 
poor is dwindling out there, but the middle America, the median income has not gone up. I mean, just barely even um, kind of uh, levels with, with inflation. Uh, and uh, the value uh, of dollar has gone down substantially. So uh, what is a quick, that's, uh, that's uh, in uh, terms of priorities, what is, where is present, that? That's the reason why I'm sitting in this chair today. That is the reason why I'm here and running for Congress. I, uh, the other day I, I went up to some people in a park um, with my button on, I introduced myself and said, I'm TJ Cox, I'm running for Congress. And uh, there was a middle-aged couple, they said, hey, we've heard about you and we've never voted before in all our lives, but people have forgotten about the middle class, and then that middle class is what makes us strong. The fellow says, my paycheck has gone up by $60 a paycheck, but my health care costs have gone up by 100 I'm losing ground, and people have forgotten about that. Uh, I'm running. Uh, I'm the Democratic candidate, and I'm proud to be a Democrat. But frankly, I'm running to represent all of the people in the district, and I think the people back in Washington have forgotten that they weren't sent to Washington to serve one party or the other party. And they certainly weren't sent to serve another branch of government. Uh, they were served, sent to represent all of the people. Article 1 of the Constitution sets up the legislative branch, and that was for a reason. It's supposed to be a government for the people, by the people, of the people. And uh, amongst equals, I think the legislative branch in Congress was supposed to stand a head higher because they were representing the people. Uh, I'm certainly not going to be the uh, flag bearer, standard bearer for any political party. I'm running to represent all of the people. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, we apparently we have a little bit more oh, time. Super. So um, uh, I was told that we can. That yeah. that um, brings me um, to actually um, uh, ask you this uh, question regarding the. Uh, that I asked earlier, but uh, rehashing the question much more um, deeper, and that's the question of uh, uh, population increase in, in San Joaquin Valley, I mean, entire Central Valley of California. Uh, what, um, with the population increase and uh, the pressure for development, and also um, problems revolving agricultural products. As you know right now, for example, milk lost its value. So many of our people are <coughs> suffering. Uh, many of our dairy men and dairy uh, businesses are suffering because of that. Uh, there are some that are losing a couple of hundred thousand dollars oh, a month. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so um, that by itself is more pressure that one of these uh, company says, okay, I'm going to stop it, I'm going to sell my cattle, and I'm going to mm -hmm. sell my land to the developer. Mm -hmm. So isn't that, these are the, this is local issue, but it has national policy implications. Because somebody down in Washington should do something about the milk, the cheese, and agricultural product that they keep them the, keep their, to, you know, have some policies to keep their values, help the export. I mean, isn't that the whole world? I mean, so many places in the world, there are hungers. I mean, there are, people are hungry and people want food and people are willing to pay for food and some of them don't have the money for food. One way or the other way, shouldn't we uh, do something about it with all this wonderful food that is produced yeah. here? Absolutely. The, uh, the thing is, it's time... Uh, agriculture as an industry and, as, and how it's perceived uh, in America, particularly in America, it needs to redefine itself and people need to realize that agriculture and our agriculture world industry is a national treasure and it's a national resource. It's a national security issue. You know, do we want to be depending on other countries to feed us? You know, as soon as we get towards that point, like we're dependent on other countries for our, for our energy sources. Yeah, you know, we're dependent on you know people that want to do us harm, and we have to do business with them because we're not self-sufficient in energy. 
and it's not too far of a step to, that we'd be self-sufficient on other countries with respect to being able to feed ourselves. So it really needs to be looked at as a national security issue and to recognize how valuable uh, agriculture is. And when you say about uh, regional growth, uh, there's huge amounts of pressure, like you said, on the farmer who might be losing money, but he's got all of this inherent value in his land. And a way to, uh, to balance that so that, right. the, that the farmer uh, can stay in business, he can keep on working the land, that is something that your federal, uh, the federal government really needs to take a, a strong hand in. And really, if, as I was saying before, about the type of landscape and country we want, not 10 years from now, but 100 years from now. I mean, we could have the entire Central Valley paved over if, uh, if we're not careful and if we don't have a plan that we all agree to and all work with. Uh, or it could be, you know, places, you know, uh, certainly you know, look at uh, um, some of the places in Europe where they've been able to maintain sure. farmland for hundreds of years and maintain nice cities with uh, light rail and, you know, streetcars and less pollution and, and uh, you know, sort of a nice balance. Uh, certain we certainly possible. don't want to turn into Los Angeles. But uh, we can see that coming unless we're diligent about that. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, being with us. We very much appreciate it. Um, Mr. Cox, uh, I wanted to thank you for taking time and um, out of your busy schedule uh, to be our guest today. It has been an honor uh, to host you and as one of our um, dialogue uh, uh, hosts. And um, we hope to see you uh, after election. Thanks very much. This has been a dialogue uh, um, at the California State University Stanislaus featuring a businessman and a congressional uh, candidate T.J. Cox. In weeks and months to come, we look forward to bringing many more episodes of dialogue to your household. So tune in next time to our dialogue. Cheers. <laughs>